Yeah, if you don't get excited by Goa Mayo, well, then, you know, Gaelic football isn't the, the game or the sport for you, for sure. And, and being from Trull originally and on the border there, Goa Mayo is always a very special game. And I think this year, it's a bit of spice to it because I think nobody really knows what to expect from either Goa or Mayo. So. The Maroon and White Pod brought to you by CityLink. For bookings, timetables, updates and any other information, head to citylink.ie. This podcast is brought to you by Steed Motor Group, Claire Galway. For your personalised vehicle shopping experience, find out more at steedmotorgroup.ie. Now we are welcome along to the Maroon and White pod. This week I'm delighted to be joined by former Mayo footballer Mark Robinson and former Galway footballer Sean Denver to look ahead to Goa Mayo in round one of the National Football League this Sunday in Pierce Stadium. Hard to believe the National League is starting this Sunday and it's the exact same uh, repeat of round one of the league we had last year where Goa played Mayo and that game ended in a draw and it's it's going to probably be tied again this Sunday. But before we get in and look at Goa Mayo, Sean, just last Friday in the Dome we had the FBD League final. Ross Common, safe to say, had a good few lads that you're going to see in the National Football League. Goa, you probably aren't going to see a lot of those players in the National Football League, what did you make? Because really, like Ross Common did go out, and they basically hammered Galway on Friday. What can we take away from that? Yeah, probably the takeaway is that they, they hammered de- development uh, squad really. Um, when you know when you're when you're looking at the team there, again, you're asking how many of them are going to be involved in the league. Um, and I can see there's arguments for and against probably in terms of giving lads chances because it is important. I'm sure. What Park Choice is looking for, and the rest of the management team is they're they're trying to get two to three to four more players that can, you know, either come on, change a game because it really is a squad. The way the game's gone now, you're 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 almost finishing with a stronger team than starting uh, the way it way it goes. But um, again, you know, it, it was tough for the lads. Also, um, it's probably you know this it's kind of something new. Galway have tried this year. You know, another year has passed. You'd have. Um, some experience as well as then trying to give new some new lads uh, a chance. Even if you look at the um the team that played last year uh, in the FBD against Mayo, you had the likes of Dylan McHugh, Matthew Tierney, Johnny Heaney, Rob Fernity, Ian Burke. I have here, um, and Co- Damien Comer came on, so it's a big difference. Um, and then you had other lads probably in the midst of that trying to make an impression, which is probably easier. You had 15 lads trying to make an impression there against uh, against Ross Crom and, and you know sometimes then the cohesion isn't as good, um, and you know the experience probably wasn't there. Um, but look, some lads you know put their hands up. Uh, some lads you know um, had a good game. And my own uh, club making you know Curry seems to have put his hand up now to to be included for the league and you know um, you know wanted the ball. I uh, wasn't afraid uh, to take a shot. And, you know, what you've seen from, uh, I think, something up to 16 scores in, in the two games. Um, you know, you had some lads like Anton Alai back, um, who was away there for 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 a while. And um, also a few other players that, you know, have been in and out. So, um, again, it'll be interesting who, you know, it's from what I've been hearing is that they that there has been, there was the FPD, and then they're they're playing other games at the weekends also, yeah. and so I'm sure that they're finely tuned now. Um, again, it's one of those things. It'll be if Galway beat Mayo well this weekend, it was a great decision, and the lads got that extra few um, weeks hard training because it is sometimes difficult when you're playing an FPD game. You can't train hard on the Thursday before, so maybe they wanted that extra session. Um, or those extra three or four sessions to prepare for the league, and there's there's an argument for that. Um, I guess we'll know how prepared they are for uh, for Sunday's game. Um, but then on the other hand, if things don't go well, maybe it's the lack of game time or cohesion. Or so again, there's always arguments for and against. Um, but it will be interesting now. Uh, I'm I'm fascinated to see who's actually going to what's going to be. Is there anyone from the FBD panel going to be on, on the the league panel, or even in the in the first twenty six uh, on Sunday? And did anyone put their hand up even for a start? Because you know FBD is about. Um, I had it myself. You you really have to build on momentum. So um, if you play well in the FBD, sometimes you get a chance in the league, and then it goes on and goes on. So um, it will be interesting. Um, but you know time will tell. Do you get excited, Mark, 
for Galway Mayo to attend the January Empire Stadium. I think when everyone thinks of those words, they think of a Gale Force breeze probably in Pierce Stadium uh, this Sunday. Yeah, if you don't get excited by going Mayo, well, then, you know, Gaelic football isn't the, the game or the sport for you, for sure. And, and being from Trul originally um, on the border there, Goa Mayo is always a very special game. And I think this year, it's a bit of spice to it because I think nobody really knows what to expect from either Goa or Mayo. So everybody's going in kind of second guessing and a bit of mystery around it for once, whereas usually we know absolutely everything about each other. It's a clear, clear forum guide, you know, who's going well, you know, who's how teams are going to, um, layout or, um, but this year it's just it, there's no form guide. I think Mayo and Goa played June 25th last year. That was Goa's last competitive game. That's six months ago. Or the guts of six months. Mayo lost to Dublin the week after in early July. So you know, in the following six months, we have nothing to go on really. Just stories of challenge matches. I think Mayo played Westmead last weekend. I think Goa played Mead maybe last week. So just going by these games, we can't read anything into the FPD because, you know, they're shadow squads. But yeah, it's it's int- an intriguing game because they're always intriguing games, but especially so this weekend because everybody's just wondering what's going to happen or how the teams are going to line out or who the new guys are going to be. So there's an excitement in that for sure. Do you support both counties now, Mike? No. <laughs> I, know, I know this is the Galway podcast, but Mayo, Mayo, Mayo. I'd be, <laughs> I'd, I'd be lynched if I said otherwise. No, my, my uh, mother is from Galway, so I'll always have a soft spot for Galway, but yeah, we always want to beat Galway for sure. It's even sweeter when we beat Galway, but I have great admiration for Galway, and I actually think with Mayo this year, I'm not really sure who we are, but I think Galway could have a big say in how things go this year. It's, it's open enough. I know Dublin are back in the, the reckoning, but I think Galway kind of took a year off last year after going so well in 2022 and getting so close to when in Sam McGuire. I think last year they maybe took their eye off the ball a little bit and probably, you know, Parted a little hard after the all Ireland final, having such a good season or whatever, and just took dry off the ball a bit. Had a few injuries, but last season was a down season. We let them off of that. But I think this year, to get to Ducks in a row, there isn't much talk about them. Nobody really knows what's going on in the camp. So I would think, oh, I have a good chance to make a serious impression this year. But I don't want them to. <laughs> let me put that on record. <laughs> Sean, just you mentioned few players there put their hand up in FPD just before we get in and look at the match. If you're looking from that development squad in FPD, who are you bringing in to be involved with the seniors? Uh, look, again, I, I probably, like uh, Mark was biased there with me. Oh, I'm probably biased with my own club, club uh, me, uh, Killian O'Curring. Um, I think what Killian has is he he's almost has the size um, to go straight into, you know, inter-county. You know, he, he has, he also has that, um, I'm sure that you know that Park Choice will be very fond of someone that can put the ball over from 60 yards. Um, and again, he does have a lot of attributes you can see, and he's a bit raw also, um, and um, which is great to see. And that's one of the things I even as an older statesman in the club scene, it's great to see you know young lads coming through because they they're almost fearless sometimes. It's, it's you know when you're playing so long and sometimes uh, doubt creeps in and stuff like that. Um, but. Um, you know, th- th- there's a few other players. You know, like like Anton Olai, who was the experience before. Um, you know, he he played under under Kevin. Um, the the keeper situation will be interesting. I know Conor uh, Flaherty didn't uh didn't start. Um, but probably one of the things Galway will be looking to adapt to, and it seems to be the kind of the, the new thing. Really, a lot of this kind of fly goalie. Um, you know, you could even see it in in the club scene really, and. It's it's almost that risk um, reward factor, and a lot of county teams and even club now seem to 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 sway to the the reward rather than the risk. Um, but then again, you know, to have the quality of keeper that you know that has played outfield also for Clare Galway it will be interesting. Will you know? Will he get another shot? Um, and um, again, it's probably uh, an area that is always kind of mentioned. Um, with, with Galway football in terms of the debate with keepers but it will be interesting now as I said um, and Mark touched on it there we are really going in blind here um, even with the squads usually the FPD would give you an idea who's even injured or who's not we you know, almost don't even know who has a niggle or um, who's kind of on form um, or who's going to play on, on Sunday so it is very intriguing um, now will there be lads brought in uh, we'll have to wait and see yeah, on the injury front, Jack Lynn seems to be uh, struggling with a niggle. Sean Kelly's obviously trying to work his way back. Matthew Tierney's working his way back. 
and Tom O'Gladden's working his way back. So it's looking like those four won't be involved um, for Galway uh, this weekend. It probably just Le- looks... Is Liam Silk back available? Do I hear in, uh, rumors of an injury there? Or... I'm not sure of the injury front. I know he's back anyways in the squad. Um, I know Keane Darcy has been playing for the development squad and he's been playing for the seniors in challenge matches. Connor Flaherty has been playing for the seniors uh, in a couple of those games as well in challenge matches. But this is interesting, Mark, because you talk about they're going into the unknown. But then there's this thing. Both of these teams kind of went all out for the league last year. And when it came to the last four, they weren't there. Do you think there's going to be a sense of both of these uh, teams nearly trying to manage their load and not peak too early compared to last year? Yeah, there's not peaking too early, but you just don't want to lose to your near rivals. And I actually think it's probably a bigger game for Galway on Sunday, having lost, you know, the last two um, competitive affairs against um, Mayo in the league final and in the championship. I just don't think poor choice would like to lose three in a row, you know, being a proud Galway man and a competitive beast like he is. Um, for Mayo, of course, we don't want to lose either. Um, but definitely last year peaked way too early. We're absolutely flying in the league. You know, everything was rosy in the garden. Mayo fans are buzzing. Kevin Max Day was absolutely buzzing. But we did definitely fizzle out in the championship. So I think if we could temper it this year and maybe, you know, survive, you definitely want to survive because, you know, Division 1 is the place to be in preparation for the championship, um, particularly next season in 2025. You don't want to be playing Division 2. But I don't think anybody would be crying if we don't get to a league final, especially with a trip to New York, I think the week after the league final as well. So, you know, Mayo won't want to be in Dublin and, you know, hopping on a bus or a plane, Dublin airport 24 hours later to go to New York. That's not ideal preparation for championship because last year the wheels really began to come off in the week after Mayo beat Galway in the Connacht final or in the league final, you know, having what a six day turnaround or a six or seven day turnaround to play Roscommon, losing to Roscommon. And that, you know, the rot began really that day. So I don't think Mayo will cry if they don't, um, win the league or get to a league final this year but we don't want to get relegated and losing on Sunday could put Mayo under a little bit of pressure because they have a tough enough run of games you know if you lose on Sunday you're probably going to have to take a win from Dublin, Kerry or Derry and that's not going to be easy on any day so I think yeah have a solid league campaign no need to be anything spectacular and just get preparation right for the championship I think Kevin Maxley will be more than pleased with that Mark, what did you make listening to Kevin Matsday's press conference there last week? Um, yeah, I, I think last year he was trying to argue the positives from last season. Last season, it ended very disappointingly. And I think there was a bit of a negative attitude in Paul around the county because everybody thought, oh, here we go again, you know, getting the hype up on the hype train and then just, you know, flatter to deceive when it comes down to it. But there were a lot of positives last year. Winning a league title is not to be sniffed at. And, you know, I think he made a point that Mayo have been in five of the major National League finals in the last five years. Is it three league finals to All-Ireland or something like that? So, you know, we're always at the business end of things. Um, and he did try to accentuate the positives. Um, you know, if you flip the season last year, if you had a poor league but a really good championship, I think everybody would be buzzing for this season. But it was the other way around. We had a brilliant league and a poor enough championship. So and just nobody's really hyped about this or there isn't too much overexcitement. But yeah, I think he was right to accentuate the positives because, you know, in Mayo we can be <clears throat> too high or too low. So I think he tried to keep an even, an even enough keel as regards, you know, our prospects this season. Sean, on this rivalry between Go and Mayo, in the early rounds of the league, does it still mean as much? Because if you look last year, from round one of the league, Galway Mayo played three times, including that, and they could potentially meet in a Connacht Championship. It would be a Connacht final this year. They could potentially meet in the league if both of them were to go all the way to the league final again. Like, It's just, with the way the system is at the minute, you're, you're playing teams a lot more now, two or three times a year. Does it still mean as much, do you think, in a round one of a league? Uh, look, there's there's no Galway man that you know would like to lose to a Mayo man, and I can sure I could say that there's no Mayo man that wants to lose to a Galway man. Um, but th- it is always at the end of the day, you know. I think when it comes down to championship, um, all the results before that in the year, you know, don't count or don't matter as much in terms of who it's it's the build up. Um, and again, you know, um. With Galway and Mayo, they'll be you know going for this game. Both teams, hell for leather. Um, 
but no one's not going to, no one's going to remember um, the last weekend of January, whoever wins the first round championship or Connacht final or knockout uh, football. And, you know, one of the things probably may have a small bit of an upper hand on going out is that knockout um, football um, when it comes down to the business end uh, and then vice versa, probably Connacht, you know, um, you know, Galway have been, and they're very tight, you know, you know, a lot of the games um, more so than ever have been a kick of a ball, um, and you could put an aggregate score, I'd say, over the last few years, and it'd be still uh, within a goal. So uh, again, look, no one, both teams will not want to lose. Um, whoever wins, and again, you know, there's <laughs> a lot to be said. It could be a draw, and would two teams be happy with a draw? Who's to know? Um, but it will be fascinating. Um, who's going to come out of the blocks? Um, often this time of year, you know, the pitch is going to be heavy. I can hear the wind swirling out there um, and it can be like that without a storm in Pierce Stadium on a sunny day. So uh, this weekend is going to be kind of going to, going to be a slog. Um, you will see one of the things I always noticed um, is you'd always see who who's done the extra slogging on the pitch or um, who's been doing training for four weeks before Christmas in the first, because when that ground is heavy in Pierce Stadium or in any other league venue, you know, and you make a hard run going off the shoulder, it's a long way back and your legs go very quickly. And if you don't have the the minutes in the legs in terms of doing those laps, doing those long distances, um, it's almost your gear to a different type of football, your body's gear to different. And then summer football, then, you know, it's hard ground, it's all snappy, it's quick, quick, quick. Um, but uh, you will see the conditioning um, and look the way it's gone now. You know, teams are getting top-notch conditioning. Um, but we'll see, I'm sure there's different, you know, thoughts when to go back, when not to go back. You want to be, um, you know, from what I'm hearing up and, you know, the the, the slog and training that Donegal have been doing under uh, Jim McGuinness uh, prior to even Christmas. Um, so, there, you know, there's different trainers of thoughts because it is, it's a long season, and especially now with the extra games. It's almost like another league um, in championship football, if you get to the the, the, the group stages. Um, so, again, long year ahead, but definitely... Uh, Sunday, both teams will be going hell for leather for a win. Just on the chunk, what are we looking at the league from a goal perspective? Are we looking for to get to another league final? Or are we looking for survival? What's the main focus for the league for Goa? I know it's a bit of a cliche, but it's performances and um, being able to perform, but also um, get a few, a few new players, unearth a few new players that can can handle the pressure. Um, and some players, you know, there'll be some lads uh, from what we're hearing is that Liam Silk will be back and some experienced, um, you know, Kieran Malloy, who, who was out last year. Uh, but also, you know, to get that bit of freshness in, you know, is there is there, um, is there there a gem out there? And I'm sure Mayo are thinking the same with the likes of Kevin McLaughlin retired and Jason Doherty. Um, I'm sure they're going to be looking for, you know, another player or two to come in and you know, grab the game uh, by the scruff of the neck. And again, if you if you finish this league, uh, as Mark said, even if it's you know mid table, you stay in Division One. You got three or four new players that are performing at a high level that have a chance, you know, to start championship. If you get a squad, then of you, like any any team that wins the All Ireland at the end of the day will need a squad of twenty five lads that all can come in and that you that you will trust all of them on the pitch. Um, you can see that even in the All Ireland finals, Kerry in Dublin the last few years, you know they use their bench, um, and you know often it is the bench. We've often talked about it with Dublin, um, how many All Irelands they had on the bench there. One of the years, I think they had, I don't know, twenty All Irelands uh, between them between the lads that were sitting on the bench uh, during an All Ireland final. Um, but they're the game changers. The way the game is so quick now, in terms of you know the physicality to it, you know that fifty minute mark. And uh, those lads coming in for the, the last 20 minutes really have to be able to perform and have to be able to add something. Um, and, you know, there's no such thing as just a number now uh, of a squad of 30 or 26. Everyone, you know, has to be able to to bring something to the table. Um, and, you know, with the injuries from last year, you know, you had Killian O'Connor uh, coming back, who I was actually only, only noticed that he's only 31 um, himself. He's like he's been around a long, long, long time. Um, but if he stays injury free, 
Um, and then other players, you know, Galway probably suffered with a few injuries last year. Shane Walsh is another one. You know, we've seen him <clears throat> in form for the club um, for Kilmacud. Um, but you know he needs to bring that form now back back with Galway, and if he can hit form, Damien Cormer stay you know injury free, um, and Sean Kelly getting back to full full fitness, it's a totally different Galway team. Add one or two more players to that, and you know they they'd be looking to be at the the busy end of the year, um, you know challenging for an All Ireland. Before we look at what potentially Galway team could start this weekend. Do you expect to see many new Mayo faces this weekend, Mick? Um, I wouldn't think so. Um, again, it's hard to go by, you know, the London game we can't read Anthony into because, you know, it was an FBD game and it was largely experimentation, even though, you know, it wasn't the worst team that Mayo could have put out. You know, there's four or five established players there, so it was a disappointing result. But no, I don't really see any bolters maybe in the line of, you know, Killian O'Curry and maybe for Galway or that. Um, I think Mayo's team will be quite established what we're really looking for rather than new players I think is just you know solving the puzzle that has you know confused us for years is how to break down uh you know mass defense I, I don't think it's really about personnel with Mayo going forward now I think it's more about tactics and strategy how do we you know unlock these defenses because even the most mediocre teams know that Mayo struggle against this so the sit back sit back allow us to have the ball and say hey try and pick a hole in this and we can't invariably we can't you know the likes of Loud, Leitrim have totally confused us and totally um, thrown us when they've done that so you know if they can do that teams with better footballers and more potent attackers will just do that and hit us on the counter every day so it, for me it wouldn't really be a question of personnel I, I don't think we're going to see too many newcomers it's more um, style tactics and strategy and just are we beginning to develop our game and you know become a more I don't know, modern team, perhaps, you know, it's not the prettiest football always, you know, just patiently trying to go back and forth to break down teams, but it's what the best teams do nowadays. And that's the way the game has gone. Um, as regards actual personnel, this talk that Fergal Boland, who again, isn't really a newcomer because he's been with Mayo previously, is back into the fold. Um, but besides that, so Bob Tuhi, but he was there last year. He played in the first round of the league against um, Galway and Casabar. So, I wouldn't think, actually, there's another guy you might have heard of, Robbie Henley might be back uh, in okay. the fold as well. So, yeah, I don't think there'll be too many, um, I don't think there'll be too many newcomers. But again, it's just a question of our, our tactics and strategy, I think, and honing a game plan rather than actually unearthing any gems, I would say. More or less, really. So it's going to be people who are in and around the panel yeah, last year. I, I would think so. And, and I could be shocked, but again... It's hard to know what's going on behind doors, but just going by that London game, which was a mix of, you know, established pros and, you know, a few newcomers, I, I can't see too many vultures. Now, maybe I'll be wrong. There's, there's a guy from Ballon Robe, Kevin Quinn, who's lightning quick, really dangerous corner forward, you know, was brilliant, lit up the Intermediate Championship with Mayo, but whether he can convert that, I think he's 26 or 27 now, whether he can convert that to um, Inter-County Championship, whether there's a gap there with Tommy Conroy and Ryan O'Donoghue going so well, in the full forward line, I'm not sure, but he could be an interesting proposition. Uh, midfielders, you know, midfielders half forward is always an area. Well, particularly since the likes of Tom Parsons, Jamie O'Shea, Barry Moore have retired, is an area where Mayo have struggled a little bit. And with Jason Darty and Kevin McLaughlin now retired as well, there's definitely gaps there. But again, I don't think you're going to see newcomers. I think the likes of Bob Tuhi, Jack Carney, Jordan Flynn, Jeremy O'Connor will have to figure that out between them there in kind of the midfield diamond. And they're all excellent players, but again, it's just establishing themselves and well not Jeremy Jeremy is well established but the other guys establishing themselves and really making themselves inter-county pros um, that's that's what Mayo would be looking for around that area but I think we're pretty well stocked in the full forward line um, just midfield middle third is maybe where we can um, where we can hopefully find some not new faces but find a bit more um, presence there perhaps If we do have a look at well, what goal a team could start this weekend? I'm going to bring both of you in. But, John, who starts in goals this weekend against Mel? Um, he seems to have a lot of faith in Conor Gleeson. Um, so, again, um, I, 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 I can't see a, anyone else but him starting at the weekend. Um, again, we're not privy to exactly what's happening uh, behind closed doors. And one of the things... Um, that will probably work in Galway's favour more so than last year is 
they were pro- they'll, they they would have had the panel together more so r- rather than the year before because my Cullen were competing in the All Ireland semi final, um, and because they had such a large contingent in with Galway, it was probably that coming and going, and and then they would have had a break after January probably. So um, I'm sure they would have had the the, the team together, but um, again, I'm not sure in terms of Conor Flaherty was it was it an, an, an injury or. Um, you know what's what's the bigger picture for him? If they see a bigger picture, is it because he's you know he was starting outfield for Clare Galway? I think he was their top scorer there in, in two years ago in the championship. So and he's very comfortable on the ball. The best um, goalkeeper in Galway is playing in Armour. Let me just put that out there. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I could argue the same point that I have my uh, me <laughs> yeah, of quite a of course, high standard of, course. of uh, Ron on Boland. Yeah. Um, but uh, I just yeah. think it, it, like Connor Carroll, he's an excellent keeper, obviously, and yeah. So I, I yeah. don't know what happened what happened there, but I think it's definitely go as last. You know, he's the modern day goalkeeper that he seems to be craving. You know, can yeah. play both both ways. But anyway, that's just beside yeah. the point. I I, I think that ship has sailed anyway. And and it is. It's almost. It's becoming. Um, it's become so, it's just such an important factor in a lot of teams of how they play, and it, you know, I don't think, um, you know, there's there's not many you know keepers out there, play, you know, that aren't comfortable on the ball now in terms of the style of play that they're looking for and the management are looking for, um. So uh, again, if you're looking at someone that's more comfortable on the ball, if that's the way Galway are going to play, and you want to bring the keeper out, well, then you know you you you'd be going for Connor Flaherty over Connor Gleeson, um. But you know Connor Gleeson probably might have a bigger boot on him if they're going you know for that kind of long kickout strategy again. So it really does depend on, you know, keepers even have different like forwards and like backs. You know, you have different attributes that you're stronger at, but then it comes down to the management. And see, okay. They're the attributes that we want to bring into this in terms of tactically how we want to set up. Um, and, you know, it'll be interesting now to see because whoever starts on Sunday is most likely, I can't imagine that they're going to be too much chip chopping and change in terms of keepers for the league. Um, you know, there'll probably be one or two games that they'll try a different keeper, but whoever starts on Sunday will probably get a run of games. And, um, you know, it's probably going to show the faith in terms of championship uh, football also. So you're probably saying there, do you expect Gleason to just start uh, given what's happened? Um... Yeah, just given what's happened, because I don't think anyone, again, you know, that, that he, he was starting before. um, And I don't think anyone else put their hand up unless, you know, something else, unless they've seen something else. And again, you know, because and that's the thing about the FBD, we, we haven't seen. So they've had league games Mark was saying then that they're playing uh, Meads I've been hearing that they're playing um, you know a lot of 15 on 15 games also and you know we don't know who's performing in those games um, so again I think, I think sorry to interrupt I think Conor Gleeson one of his best performances for Goa was actually in Goa's last competitive game against Mayo in, in Salt Hill last June uh, like he, he's had a checkered enough Goa career up to then and uh, there's always a question mark there I wasn't sure but I, I do think in all fairness he had a good day out that day in a tough conditions with that gale force win but I think his kick cuts were pretty good he was safe under the bar he made some good saves so yeah if, if you're going on recent form not that six months ago it's recent um, I think he'll probably stick with Conor Gleeson and you know see how he gets on but yeah. I think I think Goa have like four or five keepers up in the air at the minute and I don't think that's a healthy thing for goalkeepers I think you need to be clear in your mind if you're a keeper that I'm the guy because you're just afraid if any little mistake your confidence shakes, wavers a bit. And if your confidence isn't fully nailed on as a keeper, you're in massive trouble. You're really struggling. So they need to decide quickly and nail their colours to mass. This is my guy and go with it. Last year, chopping and changing, Bernie Powers in for a championship game. Gleeson was back in. And I just don't think that's a healthy situation for keepers. Uh, you see Arsenal doing it at the minute with David Raya and Ramsdale and in and out. And I just don't think you need to know who your keeper is. Your keeper needs to know that he's the number one and that just breeds confidence and sets everything going. Because if you're to win in All-Ireland, it has a team ever won on All-Ireland with a poor keeper or a mediocre keeper or a question mark over the keeper? I doubt it. So, you know, you see what Shane Ryan and Cluxton have done for Dublin and Kerry in the last year. Brilliant keepers. You just need to be fully sure who your keeper is and get that sorted because... Until Galway do, you know, I don't think, I don't think they're going to reach the promised land. Yeah, and and knowing what you know how they want to play also, you know, because you know you, you see the likes of Armar now and even Rory Bregan with um, you know, Rory Bregan probably scored more than some fours out there in Championship uh, last year, um, but there's a clear identity there. So 
you know, is Conor Gleeson going to be that keeper that will, you know, give, give you that? I'm not so sure. Um, as Mark said, you know, he, he did have a solid game. Um, but again, it comes down to what, you know, how they want to set up, how they want to play. Um, are they going to use that extra man to try to make space somewhere else? Um, and again, you know, do you have the keeper that can, you know, cover the ground, get back as quick as possible? Um, you know, even seeing it now, keepers being used um, as a third midfielder on opposition kickouts. Um, and, you know, getting that extra person on the breaks and then, you know, teams having to set up that, you know, it's almost like a last man uh, or fly goalie, almost last man back uh, covering the goal. And and it is, it's fascinating how, um, to, you know, to see, um, it probably would be very fascinating, you know, the likes of Jim McGuinness up in Donegal, will he bring something similar Um or will he even bring something nuanced um, into usually he has something up his sleeve uh, in terms of setup. So uh, again, it's about having that clear identity. Um, and as Mark said on Sunday, back in that keeper with that identity saying, you're our guy, this is how we want to play. Um, and there is a risk involved, but we feel there's more reward. Mark, uh, go with full back line, there's two injuries there to me, Sean Kelly and Jack Lynn. Who do you start in the goal full back line this weekend? Um, that's a good question. I, I didn't realize that Kelly and Lynn were injured. Uh, Johnny McGrath, definitely brilliant player. Yeah. Johnny McGrath, excellent player. I'd rate him higher than Jack Lynn, even I think Jack Lynn, serious pace. But I think Johnny McGrath, look the legs of him. I was sitting across from him in the barber shop one day, massive legs of him, and he's a hardy little buck. Some square up to Ryan O'Donoghue last year, and two tough bucks going at it now, but he didn't back down. And you know, I think he's played a lot of rugby as well. Um, you know, he'd be from Carlos Strand neighbour to Shrewd at home. And, you know, they speak very highly of him. He's an excellent player. Uh, I know last year was kind of his debut season, breakout season. It was excellent. So I, I hope he can back that up this year. But I think he's an excellent player. You know, he's got the pace. He's got the toughness. He's got the strength. He, you know, he's your modern day typical cornerback that you want. Kind of in the mold that Owen Kern was before he departed the scene. You know, he was strong. He was quick. He had all the things, low center of gravity, all the things you wanted as uh, cornerback um Sean Fitzgerald probably if Sean Kelly's out will pick up Aidan O'Shea I'd imagine that's yeah it's really between Sean McCurran's back from injury now so it's yeah. kind of kind of between them yeah two I guess Sean, and, and, and he was a cat I'm if I'm if I'm right I think he was made captain by Joyce in the under 20 when Joyce had the um not 100 percent sure but I, I think you know he uh Joyce rates him highly um and he and he's a good great footballer uh, you could see that one of the things he has actually has even for a young age that, you know, you could see his leadership qualities on the pitch. Um, even, you know, I, I've kind of seen it on in the club scene um, and and he's a big man, too. I didn't realize how big he is until you're on the pitch um, and he's he's good on the ball and he has attributes. So, again, um, where uh, where they're going to play him, I think he'll get a run um, this league. Um, if he's injury free, they'll want to give him. Never, never probably got a, a good run of games with Galway. Um, it was kind of you know some injuries, uh, but I think they'll do their best to give him as much game time as possible. Um, but where, um, you know, John Daly's kind of centre back, uh, all, um, showing up. But uh, again, one of his stronger positions would be centre back Sean McCurns. But it will be interesting. Um, you know where where they're going to have some of these players. I think Fitzgerald did well on, well, did relatively well on O'Shea last year because O'Shea had a good year, um, particularly in the league and had a good year with Bracey as well in the club championship. But I thought Fitzgerald did quite well in him that day in Pierce Stadium. You know, he's similar build, seems to enjoy the physical confrontation. So I, I'd be surprised if he didn't um, pick him up the next day, especially if Sean Kelly isn't going to be out because I think Joyce always used to love the tactic of Sean Kelly, you're picking up O'Shea and you're going to run him just all day, run him, run him, run him because Aiden, for all his strengths, wouldn't like that to have a guy who's putting him on the back foot and, you know, Kelly has serious pace. But if that option isn't available, I would imagine that it would be um, Sean Fitzgerald because I think Fitzgerald is more suited to a big guy as well. I think in the league, was it leagues? Final Division Two League final a couple of years ago against, against Ross Comedy, the tough time on was it one of Donny Smith? I think you know, a guy who's maybe a little bit more jinky, closer to the ground, has a good dummy, has a good turn. I think he'd be much more comfortable marking the likes of O'Shea, who's you know, crash bang wallop and you know, has a presence and be a good battle, I think, on Sunday if the two of them line up against each other. So, do you think we can see a full back line of McGrath, Fitzgerald, and Mulcair? Uh, I, I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, we play, we've played against Iron Islands a good bit in the last few years and Mulcairns has been kind of like a sweeper or a centre-back, which would probably suit him a bit better, I would say, because he reads the game very well. 
probably would admit himself not the tightest marker or, you know, wouldn't have a cornerback's dancing feet, perhaps. But even though he is a dancer, isn't he? So maybe he would have a, a cornerback's dancing feet. But he is, he's, yeah, I think he's a better reader of the game, maybe. And, you know, for a year as well, you know, you might be quite sharp enough for cornerback marking. I like the Tommy Conroy or Ryan O'Donoghue who are just, you know, razor sharp, you know, would be a tough enough first day out. But if it's a wet day, then that might negate that and it could be a slog. And a good player now, good at reading the game and that, but whether he's cornerback or not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I know he's been playing wing back in the last few challenge matches for Galway. Yeah. Um, but I imagine if Liam Six fit, he probably does go straight into uh cornerback just with the qualities he has. Mm. As he and, and again, Liam, Liam brings that consistency. Like, you know, he he rarely dips below a seven uh, out of ten. Um, so uh, again, you know, he he bring a bit of um solid back there and uh, i think it's kind of ready re- ready made role the way you know cornerback is now almost they spend more time up in the forwards and um, because sweeper is going back and um, so it'll be interesting if he if he starts on sunday if you were to go with mulcair in the half back line obviously john daly's going to play six seven is then interesting maybe it's kieran malloy if he's fit but i kind of want to bring in midfield here sean because Dylan McHugh has been trialed in the last few challenge games at midfield. Um and it's a, it's a, he started off there playing with Kerfin in the club championships, but then Kerfin did move him back to wing back. Is this something you trial on Sunday? Well, look, if they've been trying it now, there must be a reason. They must see something in him. Um and you know, probably with, with um again Paul Connery, another year older, you know, they might try him somewhere else, try it in full forward, try to change it up a small bit. Um, or even to have that option also to go in full forward and come out midfield and even the likes um, uh, as you said there um, you know Dylan McHugh to be able to cover the backs and midfield it's giving you that just you know almost during a game that you can change up things quicker um, and more fluidly um, Well but- I think Dylan McHugh sorry to interrupt there again I never push. imagined that he was too. I don't think he was too tall, but what he he, um, he he's one of the things I always notice about him. Like you rarely see him give away the ball, and it's kind of one of those characteristics you see in a midfielder. You know, like James McCarthy. You know, a big strong runner who never seems to give away the ball and seems to be able to time run or win a free at a certain time. So I think they're kind of building a you know maybe something like that. You know, James McCarthy type, and then someone else maybe um, that's be stronger in the air. Um, someone like you know John Maher had a great year last year also. So um, you know again, sometimes the second year is more difficult because you know you you the first year you kind of have that either freedom and uh, but now there's going to be probably more expected from him so again um he's going to have to push on and um, you know but it'll be interesting and Paul Conroy look you know he's um he, he's still there putting his hand up every every week to be involved and um it's a testament to himself that he's able to come back uh to that level year in year out you know he's he's been playing I think it almost it w- wouldn't be far off you know, 15 years now for uh, the Galway senior team. He started with um, Liam Salmon. Um, so, again, you know, it's a testament to, to his character. But also, if 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 he's, you know, given it another year, he's he's not given another year to be sitting on the bench. Like, he's looking to be, he'd be looking to start. Um, so, you know, they might try to give him a hybrid role. Um, you know, that's one of the things maybe... When we didn't have Comer, we probably didn't have that, you know, long ball threat like we did in other years. So maybe they, you know, they might try to give an extra dim- dimension. If you don't have Comer, can, can can we go for that, you know, long diagonal ball for someone else? So again, you know, we can speculate, um, but it is interesting that they're, you know, trying things like that in terms of the management, um, trying players in different positions because... You know, they're um they're a few years. This is the fourth year now. Uh, Joyce and the management team are with them, so they know the players. They know a lot of them, so they're trying to find an edge somewhere. And if that's a ch- tactical change, if that's changing somewhere, if that's adding a player to, you know, that's that's what they're looking for now. Because, um, you know, it's this. I think this is going to be treated as a big year, even for the management to see. Um, and they're really going to go for that All Ireland. Yeah, I believe it's actually year five. Is it year five? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard to believe when you think yeah. of it that. So way. again, like you know, he will, he will know his panel inside out. 
he will know what he, some of the players are capable of. Um, and again, bring in some new faces on top of that. Um, you know, it could be a big year. On that, a Dale McHugh midfield, you expect John Mayer going on last year as a man who's going to maybe partner him, him there this weekend if they, if they do go with that midfield partnership. But something I've been crying out for, uh, Mayer, on the podcast probably for the last year, I'd say, I want to see Paul Connor in the forwards because I think last year against Mayo, it was total evidence. We struggled to get scores. Our forwards struggled to get scores. I just think if you have Paul Connor at 11, like, what does this centre half back for Mayo do there? Because if he sits off him, Paul Connery has the boot on him to get scores. Yeah, he, like if you think of Paul Connery's skills, you know, it, it is his skill, his finishing, his kicking ability. Wouldn't be his aerobic capacity to be up and down the pitch. Um, I suppose they play him in midfield because of his kicking ability to, you know, kick long ball inside to the dangerous forwards. But yeah, I, I hear what you're saying about centre forward or even full forward, you know, just get the ball into whether he's comfortable with his back close to goal, I'm not sure. But get the ball into his hands around anywhere around the D and you know he's as good as anybody in Ireland just you know he's a serious kicker um, he's had a brilliant career you know and was it Kieran Murphy was on it a few weeks ago saying like this go I have underrated um, Paul Connery he, he's had a seriously brilliant career and every year I'm kind of thinking because he wouldn't be far off my age I remember I played Connacht school soccer with him around 2004 and 5 he was acting in goals that year and he was a couple of years younger than me I think I think he was like 16 I was 18 so every year I'm kind of thinking the close season comes and this is it for Paul Connery. You know, what a servant. He's given a great service to his county and, you know, he'd probably call it a day, but like savage hunger and given the injuries he's had as well to keep coming back, keep coming back. And, you know, there's an argument that he's he's getting better and better. You know, that season when um, Goway got to the All-Ireland final, OK, he hadn't the best final against Kerry that day, but he had a brilliant season and particularly early in the season and during the league and during the spring and that. So... I think, you know, a brilliant servant for Galway. And like you said, you'd imagine they will be moving him closer to goal as the years tick on rather than keep him in midfield where, you know, somebody might try to run him into the ground. And whether that works or not, I'm not sure. But in theory, it sounds like a good plan for sure. Sean, just as a previous wing forward, do Johnny Heaney and Carl Sweeney this year... As... And wing back. Don't leave out the wing back. I spent yeah. half, my, half my career there too. <laughs> But John Heaney and Carl Sweeney, that wing forward roll up and down, uh, filter and back, do they give go in the perfect balance to say have four score and forwards with these kind of two workers? Yeah, it's probably one of those, um, you know, the 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 classic, probably the last you know, ten years, the wing forward and the wing back and the wing forward dropping back and the wing and the wing back kind of um that you know, connecting with each other. Um again, it's almost more so now than it's not just the wing forwards, like it's almost the, the, the whole team, a lot of the almost drop back and then the whole team counter together. Um, but it is it does seem very, you know, organized in terms of who goes now. Goy, you know, seem to have that tactic of that they have two people sitting either pocket uh, of the you know, e- either wing back pocket, um, and that you know that someone always sits there. And that that frees someone else to be able to kind of push on and you know come on to, but again you know one of the things you need for that role is to be super fit and pace, which the two boys have, um and you know Carl Sweeney's always probably threatened to get going, um and he probably hasn't hit the heights that you know that he's he's almost uh, hit those heights, um but you know this year could be his year you know he's still quite young, um and he's probably physically coming into his own now too. Um, but uh, you know the likes of Johnny Heaney with his experience also. Um, you know you can see him offering a lot, and and then we haven't mentioned even killing Killian McDade. I know he got injured playing for Monavé there, but you know I don't know it's the extent of his injury. But you know they'd be looking at, um, you know the likes of him coming back, and again that hybrid role of wing back, for, uh, wing back and uh, midfield. Uh, and the same thing with you know wing forwards. You could even you could even see in the club all Ireland there how um, it's almost so fluid now. It's so it's so tactical. It's it's almost uh, it looks like chaos, but a lot of it is so organized. It's like organized chaos. Um, and you know you could see even um, some of the breaks in the all Ireland club finals the last day how they br- broke so quickly. Either team also bridges uh, themselves, um, and it's almost trying to leave spaces. What I notice is. Um, a lot of teams now are trying to create spaces rather than take spaces. 
and leaving you know the right spaces and the right time at the right uh, side of the pitch and then to be able to break um, and you know Mark would know that too you know there's nothing more frustrating when you know when players are doing runs for themselves and they're not trying to make runs for someone else um, and trying to open it up uh, and drag you know players with them um, so that's probably you know in terms of the wing wing forward role it's probably it was always known as the, the thankless role um, but it was often trying to make space for others and um, and then you know coming up with a, with a point or a goal you know no better man than Johnny Heaney you don't know how many times he's popped up for you know a, a goal in championship when he when it was needed um, so again you know it will be interesting to see uh, who will um, be wing forward on Sunday but one thing they will be they'll have to be they'll have to be plenty fit enough anyway to get up and down that pitch especially in Pierce Stadium on a soft soft ground As an inside forward this is not from a male perspective now Mark but as an inside forward perspective do you want to see occurring Comer and Walsh inside this weekend obviously Walsh will drift out and do his own thing but do you want to see that as the 13 to 15 that starts yeah, for sure. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. I think, um, you know, once Park Joyce saw the conundrum of how to get Shane Walsh and Damien Comer, Comer playing well together on the same day, because I don't think I've ever seen it happen, I think Goa would be really on to a winner. And maybe the key to that is having another focal point in attack who can take a bit of the heat off them. Because, you know, this occurring guy looks the business, you know, and he'll, he'll take watching, you know, in a hard um, match for Galway last Friday I thought he was you know the one shining light seemed to want the ball seemed to grow in confidence big boot and that now, sometimes there's an argument that too many cooks might spoil the broth but no I don't subscribe to that you know enough if you've enough good players win matches so if he can take a bit of the heat off Comer and you know it'll take another good man to mark him so if he can take a bit of the heat off Comer and Walsh and you can get Comer and Walsh firing on the same day that has to be for Joyce's number one aim Besides keeper, keeper is a massive issue, but also getting those two lads firing and fit on the same day, I think, you know, because time is ticking for them. They're both probably north of 30 now or have just turned 30, I think. You know, so 30, it's yeah. time for yeah, time for those two guys now to, you know, find a partnership, find whatever alchemy or magic they can have between them to, you know, drive Goway on now because like they're so talented, so talented. And when they are firing, they're almost unstoppable. But to get both of them firing together is the key. And occurring might be the thing that, you know, might be the little ingredient that makes that happen. So be good to see. Be good to see. Maybe not for the male full back line, but, you know, we'll see. Bring it on. Bring it on anyway. Just on, just on a wider scale, like when you're talking there about Walsh and Comer, Comer's just turned 30. I think Shane's a year older than him, if I'm not wrong there. Um, but Sean, is this the year when you consider the age profile of the team? Is is this the year where it has to happen for you? Uh, sometimes I don't. I don't like putting definites on things because you know there there will be an element of luck, like any say up and coming. But you know any team this to to win an All Ireland or to win you know to win anything, you, you you need a bit of luck also. And um, I think the main thing for Galway to have a chance is to keep their main players fit, um, and uh, you know to have. The likes of Comer and Shane firing at the right time and in the right places, and um, as Mark said, they're doing it, you know, on the pitch at the same time. Um, but also, you know, you know, there's vital. I'd say John Daly would be just as vital um, to that Galway team. He seems to, be, you know, to be the, you know, the orchestra. He kind of he keeps things ticking. He knows when to slow it down to quicken it up, um, and. You know, if you add one or two more players to uh, to a fully fit Galway team, well, you know they'll take some stop. And, and I think you know Sean Kelly too. You know, you know, um, and I think he mentioned he mentioned himself that you know that he was you know carrying an injury um, the more at the tail end of last year, um, and which you probably would have noticed um, against Mayo. And still, he was popping up you know everywhere. So you get a fully Sean, you know fit. Uh, Sean Kelly. I'm um, not sure about Peter Cook, what his plans are. Um, I don't you know, think anyone knows. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure if he'd know himself yet. Um, but um, again, you know, someone like him, if he if he's around for the year, he's another focal point. Um, and you get those lads, uh, you know, clicking. Uh, they'll take they'll take a hard beating. Um, and again, you know, figure out again the identity in terms of how they want to play. Um and you know this is another year too with you know Keen O'Neill and 
Um, you know, it'll be interesting now. Any team, you know, if you do the same thing you did the year before, you'll get found out. So every team will be looking for something extra. How are they going to be different from last year? You know, um, and, you know, what are they going to bring tactically? Um, you know, it will be fascinating. Um, but, you know, it, it all starts on, on Sunday. And I think, you know, all they'll want is a good performance. Um, hopefully one or two debuts um, and, you know, start the year with a win. Yeah, on that as well, like Keen Aaron and James McLaughlin are big losses this year. I think it'll probably go under the radar, but both of them aren't going to be involved this year. Keen Aaron might be involved after he does eventually come back from Erz Erasmus, but James McLaughlin isn't um part of the squad this year. So he's he's gonna be um a big loss. And we highlighted the injuries there earlier and Gilly McDade's obviously uh, probably gonna be on that injury list too. So that's probably five players go are gonna be without uh this weekend. If we are to look at the game, Mark, you've referenced you expect Mayo to go with a lot of their front runners. Just on that, do you expect Ryan O'Donoghue and Tommy Conroy to be rested because they're playing Sigerson? Or do you expect them to be thrown in? Uh, I'd, I'd say Ryan O'Donoghue will definitely start. He's really Mayo's talisman up front. And he's, I know Killing has been for years, but Killing's injury has kind of. He's been in and out a bit, so Ryan is the main man up front, and he'll definitely start. And he, he seems to be quite durable as well. You know, he plays a lot of games. He's a hardy little buck, like I said earlier. Uh, he's well conditioned that, so I definitely expect him to start. Uh, Tommy Conroy, I'm not so sure. Um, I know with he played for University of Galway last week, and but before that, he sat out a few games. He was named to start for Mayo in a few FBD games, and he didn't actually start. So I would say there's an element of minding him for sure, and given his recent history problems as well um i'd say he may not start and that'd be understandable you know they want him firing on hard grounds in crow park come next june or july or in mikhail park or pier stadium next summer when you know he really can you know put the afterburners on and you know really go for it because winter football while he, he will be very effective you know you're much more prone to get injury injured and I think he got injured this time two years ago in the the sigerson and dangan as well so there'll definitely be an element of minding him but no 100 percent ryan on who will start I'd say try key. He looks to me like the type of player that if you told him he wasn't starting, he'd <laughs> wouldn't be happy about it. I'd say a guy that just loves to play the whole time and loves ball, loves ball, and will not be minded because just go for it. I'd say. Is this important though, Sean, from a goalie's perspective to win? Because I feel like Mark's point there that he did touch on at the very start of the podcast. They lost to Mayo twice last year and a draw in between that. They're coming where they knocked you out last year the championship. Does that make it all the more important for Goa to get a result this weekend? Now, honestly, I honestly think the, the most important thing is to get a result at home because you know how difficult it is to go away in the league to some of the places, especially in Division 1. And if you start losing your home games, then it can be a struggle, um, especially your first game. Um, because, you know, I don't know who they have, second or third, but, you know... I Ross, that- Ross Common, uh, Sunday week in the hide. Yeah, so you know, again, you know, that's that's not an easy place to go to. Um, and if you're, you know, looking at zero points from four and then you still have the likes of Dublin to play and the likes of Kerry, the league can get kind of daunting enough very quick. Um, so really, you know, two points. I'd say the most important, they won't be thinking about too much um um about um, you know, the, you know, the past few results, you know, what they'll be thinking of is starting the league well, getting two points, getting out of Pierce Stadium. And then um, then you're almost kind of a little bonus territory going up to the hide. You have a bit of less pressure on you. You're able to enjoy it more. So going up to the hide and then you, you could be on four points and then you're taking on a Kerry team or um, or a Dublin team or a, a, any other team, Division One, full of confidence. So that's the thing about the league. You know, it can, can ge- go either way. And sometimes uh, teams start start off very well and then dip. Um, so and I've been you know involved in those kind of years also. Um, so it's you know it's trying to again um, really hit the ground running um, and getting those minutes in the legs. Um, you know, giving game time to you know some lads that need it and uh, going from there. But um, I don't think they'd be too worried about the past results because at the end of the day, a lot of those results you know were kick of a ball like you could have gone either way. Um, so they, I don't think they they think Mayo have now I wouldn't like you know a few more results like that in terms of being too close because 
you know, sometimes you get a psychological thing of losing by a point. And, um, but at the same time, I think they won't be too worried. They'll be just focused on getting two points, um, first home game and uh, getting the league started uh, uh, positively. So, Mark, who's going to win and why on Sunday? Um, I thought Galway because unlike uh, it would be, you know, on the topsy-turvy nature of Mayo Galway games, generally, you know, somebody wins one, another team loses one, but it's unlike a team to lose three in a row. So I thought Galway would be gunning for Sunday. But just listening to you, listing out all the players that are missing, you know, there's a lot of big guns missing. I think Mayo will have maybe more of a full strength um, hand to choose from. So mm, maybe a cautious nod for Galway just because it's home advantage. But yeah, again, probably be very tight given the nature of these Galway Mayo games. Sean? Um, I think I think Galway. I'll go for Galway. Um and just for the fact, you know, that that they're at home. Um and even though sometimes I feel like Galway prefer playing in in uh, Mikhail Park uh, when they're playing Mayo. Um but um again um I think you know they'll have uh, a few players back. Um I think they've been kind of keeping things close to their chest. I think they'll have a plan. Um, and I think, you know, they'd be really aiming for, you know, the first two league points to get, you know, get the league um, and get this run going and get a bit of confidence up um, and going from there. So I'm going to go for a Galway win. Two lads on an evening like this evening, relishing the Intermediate Championship. Yeah, yeah we're sure. not going to, yeah. going to preview the Intermediate Championship now. <laughs> we're a bit out there. Um, yeah, we, no we just happy to be fit uh, in yeah. seven months' time. No more than previewing the Goa Mayo game on Sunday and not really having a clue what shape any of it is in. Like, how do you predict the intermediate championship in Goa? Like, it's similar in Mayo as well. It's just like a, a mass of teams of similar enough ability and level and just top, top, top. It's a serious, serious grade. You know, senior have your three or four of the cream rises to the top of senior, but intermediate is just like so many similar teams that yeah. how do you predict it? How do you predict it? I don't know, you know. And it's exciting like that, in fairness, you know, and, you know, of course, we were we were very disappointed that when we got relegated. But, you know, you're, you're starting the year in a real kind of positive that you're, you're, you're aiming for, you know, big things and um and, you know, looking around, even with the teams that, you know, came down, Michaels and Spittle, um, you know, they, they'll want to I'm sure they'll want to bounce straight back up. Um, and usually it's the first year that because it's, it's when you get down to media, it's not as easy to get out of it again. Um, but yeah, it's going to be. I'm sure teams are now back this weekend or next weekend, um, quite soon now, and league will be certain. And uh, we'll see, anyways. I might see Mark, uh, it might not be a, a zoom, it might be across on the pitch, <laughs> um, hopefully at the tail end of the summer. So, uh, we'll do we'll do a preview before that, too, if you want. <laughs> Just on that, lads, uh because I was actually trying to gather up uh, all the managers there during the week from the senior and intermediate clubs, but I actually find it's a very difficult challenge um, with that. But, Mark, I don't know if it's just this year, but for me, it seems like for clubs, it's genuinely a really tough task to get a manager at adult level in Goa. Yeah, well, I'd say a few things about that. One, it's a big commitment. It's a serious commitment to do it right. You know, lads nowadays expect proper video analysis. They expect, you know, detailed plans. They expect, you know, all the things that, you know, serious athletes expect. So, you know, you can't be half-hearted about it. You have to, if you're in it, you're in it properly. Um, another thing, and it could be a factor, football isn't amazing at the minute to play, to watch. How do you coach? You know, if a team decides to sit 15 men back against you, you might say, I haven't a clue to how to break that down. I don't want to even try to break that down. I don't want to be involved in that. That could be another thing, you know, maybe it's not as attractive anymore. Um, At the senior level, you know, what is it, 17 or 18 teams in Goa at present? Is it 18? Well, it's down to 16 because the two down. to 16 down. after the two, okay. There's probably only two or three teams that can really win it. So are the rest battling for maybe a respectable quarterfinal? Was it Milton? Milton got to a semifinal last year, was it? Like, that's an amazing year for them. So... You know, unless you see a chance, in many ways, I think taking over an intermediate team is perhaps more attractive because, you know, there's a tangible reward there. You know, every team in intermediate has a decent chance of making serious headway. At senior, it's not as much. So when you throw all those factors into the mix, you know, and people are busy nowadays as well, like life is getting busier. Um, it's just maybe it's not as attractive as it once was. But if you do love football, if you 
you know, if it's something you'd like to do, I, I, and if you, it's probably the best thing after playing, you know, once you finish playing to take over a team or to go coaching a team is probably the, the next best thing. So if that's what floats your boat, I, I would say there's a lot of good clubs in Galway that would be appealing, but, you know, it, it is a big commitment nowadays for sure. And I think one of the things too is, you know, it's almost what, what the club needs and wants. And there's a big difference between getting a coach and, and getting a manager and, um, and you know it's probably rare enough that you can get the hybrid role, someone that can manage and coach. Um, and you know uh, there's uh, there's a lot of good coaches around in Galway. And I I think what you know a lot of people want now is to be able to go to train and to be able to focus on the coaching side of things, and then almost not have to worry about you know the organisational. Because at the end of the day, a manager is managing. You know that's the video analysis. That's the that's the hours. Um, outside of the training ground and organizing uh, trainings and games and um, but then you know the coaches you know specific to what drills and how the team you know you know what play what function and uh, what tactically you know what they want to do so um, uh, again it probably you, you'd always hear like and one of the probably new things I've seen now is you know clubs are advertising on even Facebook and Instagram trying you know trying to get people to come in and to show interest so um, you know there's no doubt their clubs are trying everything to get you know the best people in, um. But you know from from what I hear now, I think most most clubs are um are sorted, and there's been a, a few different um you know coaches and managers coming in, so uh, definitely definitely going to be an interesting year, I know. Yeah, and yeah, the standard in Goa is excellent. You know, I haven't played for twenty years nearly in Mayo as well. The standard in Goa excellent. Mayo is obviously excellent as well, but you know, really high quality stuff. Um. So yeah, you know it's it's a good club championship to be involved in. You know it's a good level of player, good level of club, just high quality stuff. Yeah, there's still two or three clubs looking, but it's nearly a relief for all the clubs now that have sorted their management for 2023. Because if you do let it go much longer into February, and then leagues start in March, so it's only really around the corner when you think of it uh, that way. But that's all we do. That age ourselves, Mark. Now that we'll be hanging up our boots. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> advertise, uh, advertise. <laughs> but that's all we do have time for on today's show. Uh, a big thank you to Sean and Mark for coming on.